hello, welcome to worship. I'd invite you to join me at this time in the confession and forgiveness. And blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy on us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Welcome to Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, a place of grace. All are welcome. Our mission is to seek God and serve others. We have some good news to share with our community of faith here. Abiding Presence will be offering the option for in-person worship beginning April 4th, Easter Sunday. On Easter and throughout the Easter season, there will be a worship experience in the outdoor chapel at 11 o'clock in the morning. We're still going to offer an online worship experience for those not ready to return to in person. So join us on Sunday, every Sunday in April, outside in the outdoor chapel at 11. Just to let you know that masks will be required for all abiding presence, in-person activities, and worship, and we will be practicing social distancing. And we will keep you updated on all the progress that happens in the sanctuary and in the day school as new floors are installed and construction is completed. 
We're in the middle of Lent. Our theme is building a community of grace. And each Wednesday evening, we have a midweek live-streamed worship service on YouTube that is followed by a Zoom community forum that's led by our intern, Stefan. And it's all about homelessness. And the last two weeks have proved to be quite informative and energetic and spiritual. So plan to join us for worship at 7 o'clock on YouTube and join the Zoom community forum at 7.45. And there's a lot of information online. And I hope that you're also practicing being a community uh, of grace out where, right where you are by, by reading the daily devotional each day, participating in the, the Lenten jar, gathering all your change for the mission partner of choice. And another opportunity for us to be a community of grace is our spring into faith. We're doing that on March 20th and 21st. There's going to be learning and service activities for people of all ages. So please plan to come. In fact, the youth are collecting items to prepare for some of our mission partners. We're collecting dog food and cat food for Meals on Wheels and Meals program. We're also collecting um, art supplies for the children's shelter, things like shaving cream and, and, and acrylic paint and liquid watercolor paints and masking tape and glue and half-inch ribbon. You can bring any of these donations to the church before March 20th so we can uh, share with our community and, and, and do those service projects on the 21st. And you can find all of this information about all these different Lent experiences, building a community of grace on our webpage, aplc.org slash Lent. And now let us turn our attention to the hearing of God's word. A reading from Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
A reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For, G for Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hey friends. Today we're going to hear a lesson about Jesus, and he goes into the temple, and there are these people in there, and they're selling animals, and there's these other people called money changers, and they're exchanging coins back and forth, and then Jesus overturns tables, and coins go flying, and animals go scurrying out. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but uh, I, I, I was really interested about these people that change money. They're called money changers. And as I looked into it, what I found out is that they were changing the money that uh, the Greeks and the Romans and all these different people had around there because their money had images on it of emperors or of different gods. And whenever they would come to the temple to share their money with the temple or the church... The money changers would take all the money that they had with all these different images on it and change it over to give them temple money, or they called it the temple tax. And the coin that they would give them is called the shekel. That's a cool word, shekel. Yes, so they would get this shekel, and then they would use that for all the needs of the temple or the church. So that's what the money changers were doing. And do you know who started all of that with the money changers? Moses. And the reason why is because one of the commandments has to do with idols and worshiping other things. And so they didn't want anything with different idols on it or any other gods out there inside the temple of the holies. Well, we're kind of doing something similar uh, at Abiding Presence. We're taking coins and, and, and with all kinds of different images on them, and we're inviting you to take a jar at home and for Lent, and have your own Lenten giving jar. And this is mine. And see, it's got Lent right there. And I've got some change here. And I'm putting my change that I got from, you know, getting something at the store or stuff that I found in the car seat or in the couch cushions. And I'm putting it into my jar for all of Lent, 40 days of Lent. And I'm collecting this change because I'm going to bring it to church on Easter. And everybody's going to bring their change to church on Easter. And then the church is going to take all this change, turn it into dollars, and give it to all the mission partners. And this is going to go out into the world to help a lot of people. Because at the end of the day, the money that comes to the church, the coins that we collect at the church, they're not for us here to just store and hang on to. These are used for other people. And for this Lent, we're taking coins and making change in people's lives. So I hope you'll join me in that. Let's now sing the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, 
He found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their tables. And he told those that were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And then Jesus said to him, then, excuse me, then the Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We've been talking about covenants throughout Lent. Remember, covenants are things that God makes with us. They are one-sided in nature, but there's actually a little bit more to covenants uh, that God makes with us. Each one has been made so we might be in relationship with God as well as in relationship with each other so that we can reveal God to the world. From the beginning, God dwelled with our first parents in paradise and, and, and revealing the divine nature of God to those living there, showing how much God longed to be in this relationship with people. And the Ten Commandments are another example, and we hear about them in our Old Testament lesson today, about God's desire and longing to dwell with us, longing to be in relationship with with us because the Ten Commandments are all about relationships. If you look at the first three commandments, they're all about our relationship with God. And the other seven commandments are all about our relationship with each other. How are we to relate to God? And how are we to treat each other? And later on, Jesus actually takes all of these laws and sums them up with love God, love neighbor. Moses is telling the Israelites that by living in these commandments, we reveal God to the world and are living in this divine relationship into this covenant, which is amazing enough. But God doesn't stop there with the Ten Commandments. God longs to be active in this relationship as well, coming down to us. Remember, God comes down, wanting to dwell with us, wanting to dwell with us within us. And the book of Exodus is where we can see this all play out. Most of us already know the story of Exodus. We know about Pharaoh, and we know about baby Moses, and, and, and the Israelites enslaved, and all the plagues, and, and the Red Sea parting in two, and, and, and going out into the wilderness. And, and, and then, of course, we hear about water from rocks, and manna from heaven. And then today, we're given this beautiful Ten Commandments lesson. But that's only half of the Exodus story. The rest is all about the tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? How to build the tabernacle? And then actually building the tabernacle. And that takes up the rest of the book of Exodus. And this is important because the tabernacle is the place where God dwells with God's people. The place where heaven and earth meet. The place that overlaps God's heavenly home. And Exodus tells us that this tabernacle was modeled and, and, and decorated and made after the Garden of Eden, after paradise, where this divine relationship started. This tabernacle was established for God to live in relationship with us, a place for us to dwell with God so we can reveal God to all creation. Now, later on, the tabernacle that is described in Exodus 
is replaced by Solomon's temple, but it has the same purpose. And then that temple was destroyed during the Babylonian exile, and then generations later, they started to rebuild a second temple. And when Jesus enters into the temple in our gospel lesson today, he's walking into that second temple, which was modeled after the first, which was modeled after the tabernacle, which was modeled after paradise, all meant to reveal God to all the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, in the waters of baptism, you cleanse us, claim us, and call us out into the world to reveal you in everything that we say and do. Help us live into the promises we make in our baptism, marrying your faithfulness you show us in each covenant. We pray in your Son's name. Amen. So Jesus is entering into this temple, and it's clear that he's disturbed by, by what he finds, because there are merchants, and there are temple tax collectors, and there's animals, and they're scattered all over the worship space of the temple. But it's not like they weren't welcome at the temple. In fact, the outer courtyards had been set apart for these things to happen, for these types of activities. The issue is that it's inside the temple, inside a worship space of the temple. See, back then it was really common for people to bring their animals for Passover or for sacrifices to the temple. It was common for merchants to sell animals for those that maybe didn't have an animal or maybe the trip was just so long that the animal couldn't make it with them. And it was common for money changers to be at the temple to exchange the Roman and the Greek coins, which were so plentiful and so different, into that temple tax, that shekel. And it was common for the temple leaders to be there to collect this temple tax, to be used for all the mission and ministry of the temple. The issue is not that this was happening. It's that over time, somehow, someway, these common practices had been absorbed into the actual worship space, one of those worship spaces of the temple. And doing so, they're breaking the commandments by bringing in these graven images. They're, they're, they're intruding on the divine nature of the temple, and they're stepping on the toes of what God has already prescribed for us through Exodus. And, and I don't know how this occurred. Maybe it was just absent-minded convenience. That, that, that it's just easier to do business inside here. That's where people are coming. Or maybe it was just an expansion of just what was already happening all around them. But either way, the focus was on the transfer of coins and the selling of animals for sacrifices and not on revealing God to all the world. So Jesus goes in there, and he's upset, and he makes a whip. Now, I got to tell you, as a kid, I always imagined Jesus just going in there and just tearing them up and just whipping them all over the place and getting every person he could find, and they're just, yeah, and they're running out. But I, I don't know if that's actually what's really happening here. Because a whip was the tool that was used to move animals from one place to the other. So he takes this whip, and he's just driving out the sheep and the cattle and all the animals that are gathered within there. In fact, if you read Scripture, it says he calls out one of the merchants. He says, get those birds out of here. Take those doves away. And then he takes all the coins, and he pours them out onto the ground, all these graven images onto the ground. And then he turns the tables over because none of what they're doing in here is revealing God. And then all these emotions are high and people are shooing birds and cows are running out of the temple worship space. And in all this confusion and chaos, the leaders challenge Jesus, show us a sign. He kind of just did. And Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Oh, come on, Jesus, we've been building this temple for 46 years. You think you could raise it in three days? Now, the gospel writer John, remember this, this whole gospel was written that we may come to believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and have life in his name. This gospel writer lets us in on what's really happening here. Jesus is speaking about himself. Jesus is the new temple, the new tabernacle. God dwells within him. 
And in his destruction or his death and resurrection, heaven and earth meet and God is revealed to all creation. Which is exactly what happens. As this new temple Jesus walks with his disciples after his resurrection, he breathes on them the Holy Spirit and heaven and earth meet with his followers. The same spirit that we have received where heaven and earth meet with us. God dwells within us. We are many temples, many tabernacles, cleansed in the waters of baptism, made clean, claimed as beloved, this new creation meant to continue this holy narrative that reveals God to all the world, rejoicing in the relationship with God and with each other along the way. And I truly believe that this is something that we have to work at on a daily basis with great intentionality. Because it's way too easy, it's way too easy to let the ways of this world crowd this temple with merchants. Giving in to the absent-minded conveniences and comforts of things around me. Exchanging this relationship for so many graven images of the world. What tables need to be toppled? What crowds the sacred space within us? Are we willing to drive out those things that get in the way of our relationship with God and with each other that block us from revealing God and everything that we say and do? This temple is holy. God dwells within it. This is now the place that overlaps God's heavenly home, the place where heaven and earth meet. And through it, we have the ability to reveal God to all the world. Amen.
Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the Church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your Church that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your Church that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. Defend the victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that mostly serves our own interest. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please, wherever you're at today, if you're at home, share Christ's peace with one another. Maybe send a text or give someone a phone call, but share God's peace in the world. Jenny, peace be with you. It feels a little different talking about offering when we read about Jesus cleansing the temple um, as the money changers make it a marketplace. But the fact is, they may have lost track of the sacred purpose of the temple as the place to reveal God to all the world. Abiding presence practices intentional transparency and honesty with open communication in all of the financial affairs. More so, this place of grace takes each coin that is received and changes it into ministry and mission that reveal God. Thank you for your continued generosity.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have blessed us with our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our communities, and the resources of this earth. Lead us and guide us to use these gifts in accordance with your will for the sake of the one who is with us to the end, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into the darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. Send your spirit of truth, O God, rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of the world in need. Faithful to your word, draw near to all who call on you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace, share the good news.